Hello and welcome to our June live uh, stream here on Hedgehogs Hollow, the channel for people who are passionate about hedgehogs. And this evening, I am very, very excited to be joined by another PhD in hedgehogs, and this is Dr. Hedgehog, uh, Sophie Rasmussen, Sophie Lund Rasmussen. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. It's lovely to have you here. Thank you, Mike, for inviting me. I'm very thrilled to, to be here. Oh, you are very, very welcome. It's lovely to have you. We have heard very much about you because I've had other live streams. I've had other little guests who have mentioned you before. New Warwick has mentioned you. Uh, Lucy Behrman Brown has mentioned you. It is exciting to have another PhD in hedgehogs here on the channel. So a very, very warm welcome. Now, you're from Denmark, but actually you're not currently in Denmark. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, I live in Oxford here in the UK now. Okay, so you're actually living in, in Oxford. Well, welcome, but it's lovely to have you from Denmark. Uh, lovely to have you along. And it's lovely to have everyone else that is, is here. Let me know, as always, in the chat where you're joining us from. It's lovely to know where you are and get involved in the, in the chat. So uh, by all means, put your comment in the chat and, and let us know where you're joining us from. And we're going to be discussing in particular Sophie's most recent research all about automatic lawnmowers and the impact that they're having and do have on hedgehogs. And it's absolutely fascinating. I can't wait to get in, in, into it. And I know that Sophie's got a lot of information she wants to share with us. But before all of that, I just want to start with understanding where it all started for you, Sophie. You are you're referenced as a specialist in European hedgehogs, but what made you research hedgehogs and why such a passion for hedgehogs? Where did that all start? Well, I've always loved hedgehogs ever since I was a small child. And uh, I remember putting up a tent in the garden to, to be able to, to lie in the tent at night and, and watch the hedgehogs in our garden. So they've just always fascinated me. They're one of the few wildlife species you can get really close to. Uh, and, and they're very particular as well. So, um, so I've always loved hedgehogs. And I knew I was going to, to study biology uh, and work with conservation and, and behavior of, of wildlife species. Okay. And, uh, and then I signed up to become a volunteer at a wildlife rehabilitation center in Denmark, where I hand raised a lot of uh, orphaned hedgehogs or hoglets. And then I just began to wonder uh, whether they would be, actually be, be able to, to survive when, when they were released back into the wild. And I was uh, supposed to do my master's thesis in biology. And when I started looking into hedgehogs, I, I realized that not a lot of work had actually been done on hedgehogs uh, mm -hmm. research um, in general, and particularly not in Denmark. So I thought, okay. why not try that? <laughs> <laughs> so so it's so interesting to hear you talking about Denmark. I mentioned to you earlier we we've had I've had a lot of guests and a lot of discussion a lot focused and and based here in the UK and I appreciate you're also based in the UK but tell us more about the hedgehog population in in Denmark. Is it is it suffering the same as, as it's suffering throughout Europe? Is it is it healthy? Is it recovering? What what is the hedgehog how are hedgehogs doing in Denmark? <laughs> yeah. So there's not really a short answer to that question. The thing is that I'm the only hedgehog researcher in Denmark. And, and my PhD in hedgehogs was actually the first in, in the scientific history of Denmark, uh, the first hedgehog PhD, uh, which means that all the work being done on hedgehogs um, is actually carried out by me in Denmark. But this also means that we don't have the same monitoring programs as, as some of the other European countries. For example, here in the UK, where researchers have looked into hedgehogs for several decades. So we don't have sufficient data to actually say something about uh, the state of the Danish hedgehogs. But as you know, research from all over Europe indicate that uh, the hedgehogs are in severe decline and um, I'm convinced the same goes for Denmark as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I talked to a lot of people about hedgehogs, obviously. <laughs> well, <laughs> you they... said to me you were on you were on national Danish national TV last night as well, yeah. talking about hedgehogs, weren't you? <laughs> yeah. yeah, 
with a lot of viewers explaining how to avoid uh, burning hedgehogs in fires because it was Midsummer Eve uh, last night. So there's a tradition for bonfires in Denmark. So okay, um, okay. But uh, so, so interesting so because in the in the UK, I'm sure you know we we have we have mm -hmm. that kind of focus around around bonfire night in November, and there's a great concern that the hedgehogs will climb in, especially in winter, will climb into log piles that are, are intended for those those types of bonfires. So it's interesting to hear the same thing applies, but perhaps at a different time of the year. Yes, and and in Denmark, there is a tendency for people to have very very nice gardens with short lawn and uh, and that's it. So they're not very wild or messy. So when people actually build a bonfire, it's a perfect opportunity for the hedgehogs uh, to move in. It's a perfect nest site. Uh, and being short of nest sites, they will actually use them. Okay. Uh, so so it, it is a concern. So it's very important to, to inform the public every year, every Absolutely. single year to, to check the bonfire or, or perhaps even move it on the day that it's going to be lit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now, you, you've spoken about the fact that you're the only researcher doing any research into hedgehogs in Denmark. And has that is that why you have set up the Danish Hedgehog Project? Yes. So that was actually my PhD project, okay. which I carried out at the University of Southern Denmark and Naturama uh, from 2016 to 2019. Um, it all came about because every time my husband and I drove past a dead hedgehog on the road, uh, I would get very upset. And, uh, and, and one day he just said to me, Sophie, then stop crying and then do something about it. Make use of these deaths. And I decided that I was going to try to use the dead hedgehogs to understand the living so that they wouldn't have died in vain. So the Danish Hedgehog Project is all about using dead hedgehogs for research. And uh, it was a citizen science project. So I basically asked all the Danish citizens to collect dead hedgehogs for my research. And I ended up with almost 700 dead hedgehogs from all over Denmark. Wow. Uh, a wonderful sample set. Yes, and, uh, absolutely. And, and, and they've now, now been um, uh, autopsied or necropsied, and we've taken out a lot of different samples. And just to give an impression, uh, 697 dead hedgehogs, they take up the space of 14 big uh, freezers. Uh, and, um, you know, the ones that, that stand, you know, horizontally, yeah. very yeah. large freezers, yeah. Um, and uh, some of them were completely flat uh, and some of them were intact. Okay. Uh, some came from, you know, the, the roads, uh, road mm -hmm. kills. Some just died naturally in people's gardens. And we also had hedgehogs that died in care. Okay. Um, so they've been used for all sorts of different research uh, so far, and we still have a lot to do. And that's that's fantastic. I know uh, earlier, kind of during Hedgehog Week here in the UK, I had an interview with Grace Johnson from Hedgehog Street, who runs and, and operate the, the big hedgehog map. And one of the things I was I was discussing with her was this concept of not just mapping live hedgehogs, but also mapping dead hedgehogs that you may have, have seen on the road or by the side of the road or in fields or things like that. And just understanding that actually the, the dead hedgehog, and, and to your point, that the dead hedgehog has some story to tell and some some research value as well, be it if you're mapping it on, on the big hedgehog map or like yourself storing it in a freezer, but, but being able to extract all of that useful information from that individual hedgehog. Yes. And also, so when people um, brought the dead hedgehogs to us, we asked them to uh, fill in a form uh, stating exactly where they found the hedgehog and which date so we also have all the information about the locations of these dead hedgehogs. And one of the things I'm hoping to do in the future uh, is to, to actually have a look at the different uh, roads where they were killed. Are, are there certain features that actually determine where the hedgehogs are being run over? Is it a, you know, 30 miles uh, per hour zone or, or is it because the, the road is surrounded by gardens or woodland uh, can can we actually point out hotspots for these collisions 
uh, because then we can actually do something about it. We can we can put up you know hedgehog crossing road signs and so on. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the things I'm I'm hoping to achieve with this uh, with this, this data set. That's that's fantastic. I I wanted to have a little bit of fun very quickly because I don't often get the opportunity. But what? How do you say the Danish word for hedgehog? So this is a pinsvin. Pinsvin. Yes. <laughs> okay, because I I have seen as well that you've got a T-shirt that says Dr. Pintsveen because you're yeah. Dr. Hedgehog in Denmark. So, for everyone watching, Pintsveen. If you're ever in in Denmark looking for hedgehogs, you're looking for a Pintsveen. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's that's our word the, of the day. And the the direct translation is stick pig. Is stick pig. Stick pig. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's it's very it's very similar in in thought process in terms of the English being hedgehog, the the stick pig or the the hedge pig. So that's yeah. good to know. So so we're talking about pince fin. Uh, before we get into the main topic of conversation this evening and looking at your research, I just want to pause quickly and say hello to some people. Anna's joining us from Oxford as well in Barton. Uh, hello, Anna. Welcome along as well. Uh, Heather is always welcome because she's a regular here. Heather Witchley <laughs> from Sussex, welcome along. Uh, I told you we had an international audience. Barbara is from South Africa. Uh, Catherine is from Germany, so that's kind of closer to Denmark. Um, but Catherine, I think you were mentioning about the, when you say same here, it's about having um, fires at around Easter time, bonfires around Easter time. So it's interesting that we all have the same types of issues. I say it's issues, but the same concerns for hedgehogs at different points in, in, in the year. So that's really, really interesting. Uh, and then Andrew, welcome along from, from Bolton. Again, if you've joined late, do let us know where, where in the world you're joining us from. Dr. Hedgehog Sophie Lind Rasmussen is my guest this evening and the topic of conversation, and this is what we're gonna discuss for the rest of the evening, automatic hedgehogs uh, and the impact they're having on uh, sorry, automatic lawnmowers and the impact they're having on the hedgehogs rather than automatic hedgehogs. Automatic lawnmowers. Now, we were saying earlier, uh, Sophie, when I spoke to you earlier in the week, we were saying that perhaps this is something that may not be so familiar to us necessarily in the UK. I know it's something that's quite prevalent, uh, a very well used garden implement in um in more in, in kind of continental Europe, the, this concept of an automatic lawnmower. So can we just start on, on just understanding what exactly do we mean when we're talking about an automatic lawnmower in your research? Yeah, well, it's, it's basically a lawnmower that is very similar to uh, the automatic uh, vacuum cleaners, if you know those. Yeah. Uh, so so they, they just drive around and, um, and, and mow the lawn for you. Uh, without you having to to push it uh, or something like that, so it's just basically a small robot uh, driving around cutting your grass. Okay, okay. So, and how? Whilst I can I can kind of get the concept of what may be the danger. How? What led to this research and the thought that there may be a a, a concern around the health of hedgehogs relative to these automatic lawnmowers running around lawns? What what led to the research? So in, in Northern Europe, where robotic lawnmowers are very popular, uh, pictures of injured hedgehogs have circulated in the press and on social media for the past years, encouraging garden owners to stop using robotic lawnmowers in order to prevent causing harm to hedgehogs. Uh, but yet, other garden owners have argued that they own a robotic lawnmower and have several hedgehogs in their garden and have never experienced that the hedgehogs were injured. But injured hedgehogs are frequently admitted to rehabilitation centers with different types of cuts and wounds, and sometimes they're even lethal. And some injuries are consistent with known risks to hedgehogs in the form of, for example, garden strimmers uh, and dog bites. These are injuries uh, that we see all the time in the UK as well, unfortunately. But until now, it has not been documented whether some of these injuries could actually have been caused by robotic lawnmowers. 
So I just decided that it was time to to actually figure out whether this this was right, uh, and um, and and do something about it if this was the case that that robotic lawnmowers actually hurt hedgehogs. And so how do you go about then doing scientific research like this? Tell me what, what was your, your process and how did you go about constructing your research? Yeah, so, so basically we wanted to test on real hedgehogs because we knew that the manufacturers of robotic lawnmowers had tried to test on different sorts of fruits, for example, to try and mimic a hedgehog using a, a pineapple, for example. And... Um, and, and this just didn't show the, the true, the realistic results. We wanted to, to mimic reality. So what we did was that we, we asked the Danish hedgehog carers to collect dead hedgehogs uh, that had died in care uh, for our research so that we could test on real dead hedgehogs just to try and, and, and mimic reality as best as possible so that we could get uh, results that we could actually uh, trust. Um, so, so this was how it all started. And then we had to select which machines to test because there are a lot of robotic lawnmowers on the market. And, uh, and we got some help from a product expert uh, on robotic lawnmowers and uh, and we selected 18 different models of robotic lawnmowers representing all the different technical uh, specifications on the market. So we were trying to, to basically show all the different types of, of lawnmowers with different technical uh, features. Um, and, uh, and then we, we had to test on the dead hedgehogs. What we did was that we divided the hedgehogs into different uh, weight classes or age classes okay. because we, we had a, a wide range of, of dead hedgehogs at our disposal, unfortunately, you could say. Um, but these were, were juveniles that were still dependent on their mothers mm -hmm. when they died and independent juveniles so that, that, that's the, the individuals that uh, have become independent. They're out coping on their own. They weigh from around 200 grams onwards. Mm -hmm. And then we had adult hedgehogs and uh, large adult hedgehogs. Okay. Uh, we assume that the larger ones are the older ones. Yeah. But these robotic lawnmowers, they, they come with the, you know, detection sensors. So, so they're actually supposed to, when they're uh, running around on the lawn, to, to avoid um, footballs and uh, toys and, of course, children's feet and so on, yeah. um, and, and all sorts of obstacles. Uh, but perhaps uh, we, we would see a difference between their ability to detect a large hedgehog compared to a very small one. Yep. So that was why we divided them into to different age classes. And then each uh, machine, each robotic lawnmower was tested 12 times. So on four different, uh, four different hedgehogs, each tested in three different positions. And I'm going to show you a picture of the setup uh, we used for this. Mm-hmm. I hope you can see it now. There we go. I think we've got it. Yeah. <coughs> so basically, we, we placed each of these uh, hedgehogs in, in three different positions. One where the hedgehog was supposed to be curled up with the back towards the mower mm -hmm. and uh, curled up with the stomach towards the mower and then standing in front uh, of the mower with, with the nose pointing towards the mower. and. Um, and we did that because we thought these three scenarios would be the most realistic scenarios. Um, in knowing about the natural behavior of hedgehogs, they tend to curl up or, or completely stand still and then run away. And of yeah. course, we couldn't test the scenario where they ran away. Uh, that wouldn't be very relevant either. But uh, so these were the different positions we used. And, um, and we, we recorded everything uh, with a small uh, video camera. Uh, so we had documentation for, for all the tests we ran. Yes. And, uh, yeah, then we, we recorded what happened. We started the automatic lawnmower three meters from the hedgehog uh, and then directed it towards the hedgehog and it started approaching the hedgehog. And then we recorded what happened. Um, and 
this was really interesting actually because I had expected that the majority of these machines were able to detect the hedgehogs and just uh, change directions as as you see with the robotic uh, vacuum cleaners in your house. I mean, my vacuum cleaner is able to navigate between all my son's toys on the floor and <laughs> uh, without running them over. Yeah. Um, what we did see was that all of the machines actually had to physically interact with the hedgehogs in order to detect them. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. so they have all these uh, detection sensors and, um, and lift sensors and, and everything, but they actually had to to get into physical contact with the hedgehogs. In in the majority, or, or in some cases, I would say, they, they would uh, drive up to the hedgehog and then give it a small nudge, like just pushing it lightly, uh, and then change directions and everything was fine. Um, the next damage category, as we called it, was when the, when the machine um, pushed the hedgehog, uh, to a degree where the, the dead hedgehog would actually, uh, you know, change position. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, it, it would, if, if this uh, hedgehog was alive, it would have caused uh, perhaps a bruise in, in the worst case scenario, but then the machine changed directions. Okay. Um, then there were cases where the machines did not detect the hedgehogs and then just completely ran over the hedgehogs. Okay. But the safety measures, the things they have to live up to to be approved on the European markets, um, actually describe how if the lift sensor of the robotic lawnmower is uh, activated, uh, when the lawnmower has to lift itself self up over the hedgehog, uh, the knife should stop running within uh, two seconds, I think it is. And some of the machines lived up to this. So, okay. so they didn't detect the hedgehog, uh, but but kept running over the hedgehog, but then stopped and, and the knife switched up, which meant that the hedgehog wasn't actually injured or wasn't cut by the knives. Yep. You could say that it's not very pleasant. So these were dead hedgehogs, but for a live hedgehog, it wouldn't be very pleasant to have a robotic lawnmower uh, on top of you. But but still, it, again, it could have been, you know, bruising or something like that. Um, but unfortunately, there were also cases where the machines uh, did not detect the hedgehogs, ran over them, and the knives wouldn't stop. And uh, and this was actually it was horrible to mm. witness uh, for the whole research team because we obviously all all love hedgehogs. Yeah, absolutely. Why we would do hedgehog research in the first place, and. Um, and, and the types of injuries ranged from small puncture wounds uh, to, you know, complete decapitation, uh, disembowelment. It was awful. Um, in some cases, we had organs flying around. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it made us very upset, actually, yeah. to, to witness this. But it also goes to show that this is extremely important research. Because yeah, absolutely. I, had, I had no idea... That, that some of these machines could injure the hedgehogs so so lethally. I mean, mm. it, was, uh, it was awful. Um, and now we can actually do something about it because now we have the proper documentation for this. Yeah, um, absolutely. Because earlier people would, you know, call the hedgehog rescue sensor saying, I have this injured hedgehog and I'm just absolutely certain it was my next door neighbor's sister's uh, a cousin's a robotic lawnmower that did it, but nobody had witnessed it or or filmed it, or so so we just didn't know um, whether this was actually what had happened. Um, but uh, but now we know it can happen. Mm -hmm. so, so the results basically showed that some uh, robotic lawnmowers were not uh, dangerous to hedgehogs. I mean, the best case scenario would have been that the robotic lawnmowers were able to detect the hedgehogs at a distance and change direction. But okay, I mean, to, to, to drive up to the hedgehog and give it a nudge and then change directions could perhaps also teach the hedgehog to avoid the robotic lawnmowers in the future. Oh, this wasn't very pleasant. I'm not going yeah. to do that again. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but, but still, so, so it was, um, the results were very diverse. So we had these instances and then we had 
uh, the robotic lawnmower sets that actually mutilated the dead hedgehogs we tested on. Yeah. So you were saying you were saying that you're now in a position because of all of that information and you say documentation, but I'm sure it's not just documentation and what you've written up. It's it's that video evidence because you've been able to track 18 different machines, 12 different tests for each machine. Yeah. So you've got a huge amount of information, both yeah. documentary and video evidence. Yeah. What what are you now able to do other than providing like presentations like this and i know you've you've done others and other than providing information to to the public so to speak you started off by saying there was a product expert that helped you and someone from the industry how open to the to this research and and kind of feeding this research back into their products is the industry perhaps it throughout europe what what what's next so I've, I've been in close contact with several of the, the larger manufacturers of robotic lawnmowers. And they are really interested in uh, improving the safety for, for hedgehogs and, and wildlife in general of their machines. Um, of course, uh, it, it's a, a question of, of you know money as well, because if the consumers know that they're safe for wildlife, they are more eligible to, to buy them. Um, and they, uh, the manufacturers, Obviously, they've had a lot of fuss about this, especially with hedgehogs. A lot of people contacting them and, and being very angry about this, which is completely understandable. But they are extremely interested in learning how to improve the safety for the hedgehogs and, and wildlife in general. And, uh, and what we found uh, was uh, some differences in the technical uh, specifications that actually influenced the results. So I'm going to show you a picture now of the two different types of blades you can find um, on a robotic lawnmower. Can you see the picture? Yeah. Yeah. So on picture A, we have what is known as fixed blades. So these blades are just completely fixed and, uh, and they drive around, so they spin. And on picture B, we have what is known as pivoting blades. And, and these blades fold away uh, underneath this uh, skid plate whenever yep. they hit something harder than grass. Okay. So it's actually a feature meant to protect the knives, uh, but, but this turned out also to protect the hedgehogs because okay. In the majority. So just, just, sorry to interrupt you just before we carry on, just to make sure that I'm seeing this correctly. On, on picture A, you've got two triangular blades that are what you call the fixed blades. And I'm assuming that the, the blade element is right at the very point of those triangles. Yes. But they just, they are fixed and they just spin around under the lawnmower. Whereas in picture B, you've got that round uh, kind of plate which is the skid plate as you described it would sit still on top of this so it's been removed but then you've got on three different places you've got what look like little fold away blades which are these pivoting blades yes and that allows them to at least kind of hide so to speak or be concealed under a a skid plate that you can't see there so actually that that means they can fold away and then there's there's kind of no harm in the way that the, the fixed blade simply can't fold away is that Am I seeing that correctly? Yes, exactly. Okay. So, so what we saw was that in the majority of cases, the robotic lawnmowers with pivoting blades, I mean picture B, mm -hmm. where the small knives actually fold away into this protective plate when they hit something harder than grass, this could be a, be a hedgehog. Um, they were actually, uh, these robotic lawnmowers with, with this particular feature, pivoting blades, uh, um, were more safe for the hedgehogs. Mm -hmm. We had a few instances where uh, the models had pivoting blades and still hurt the hedgehogs. So that was down to their uh, detection system instead. Okay. But uh, but this was um, very interesting to see. I'm going to hide this picture again. So so this this is one of the messages um, we could actually give to the manufacturers. Okay. The pivoting blades are just more safe to, to hedgehogs. Yeah, yeah. We also found that uh, robotic lawnmowers with uh, three wheels 
and the front wheel drive were more safe to the hedgehogs. And I think that could be explained by the fact that these models uh, had, you know, smaller motors. Um, so in general, uh, it takes more motor power to, to drive the fixed blades. Uh, and, and these robotic lawnmowers are just more massive and, and, and they drive with more force, perhaps yeah. leaving the detection system less sensitive to hedgehogs compared yeah. to, to a machine that is more light and, and perhaps runs a bit more slowly. Um, so we, we think that's the explanation for this. Okay. Uh, but but all of this information has been passed on to to the manufacturers, uh, and they're now taking a very close look at at their different uh, models and how they can prove them. Brilliant. Um, but it's obviously very important to improve the safety of the machines. Yeah. And it is my hope that we'll be able to establish a, a sort of standardized test testing the hedgehog safety of the machines. Yep. So every time a robotic lawnmower is approved for the European market, it has to go through certain uh, safety tests uh, at the European test center. So perhaps they could include a hedgehog safety test as well, yep. enabling um, a labeling system uh, that would indicate whether the machine was hedgehog friendly or perhaps even just wildlife friendly in general. Yeah, yeah. But this, of course, takes um, some more information and in particular a, a hedgehog crest test dummy which we put the uh, mass produce because i mean it, it doesn't make much sense to to having to use uh, a dead hedgehogs for each uh, test especially because they're tested several times and, and so on uh, as a yeah. standard so so i'm actually uh, collaborating uh, on trying to create the perfect hedgehog crest test w right. um, and it's uh, it's quite challenging because you you really want um, a, a model that is representative of hedgehogs um, which means that you can't just you know make uh, you know a, a completely random plastic hedgehog uh, you actually have to try and match the size the the weight uh, the you know texture of the hedgehog. So so mm -hmm. right now we're trying to create uh, different layers of uh, of plastic and foam and so on. So to try and mimic you know the the texture mm -hmm. of a hedgehog. Yep, yep. And and how to to three D print all the spines and make the spines as realistic as as possible. And uh, <coughs> lastly, how would you you know mass produce <laughs> this? <Yep>. Uh, <laughs> The this thing that crash test dummies. That's it's, fantastic. It's really, it's really my hope that we'll be able to 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 do this and and create a standardized test. Um, and it's, it's it's important too because I know, for example, and and you'll be aware in the UK, the protection of hedgehogs by law is is different than the protection of hedgehogs. Uh, I know specifically in in France, and I suspect other places, and I suspect perhaps Denmark is really quite stringent perhaps around the protection of hedgehogs that uh, certain interactions with them you have to be licensed and things like that so actually it's interesting to tie your research and the thinking around uh, a specific hedgehog friendly or wildlife friendly badge for these types of garden implements actually helps kind of the consumer and these companies almost abide by the law so to speak yeah Exactly, and uh, and some have suggested that it should be law uh, to to only sell uh, hedgehog friendly machines because in Denmark uh, they are really heavily protected. Yeah. Uh, you even need a license to be allowed to care for the hedgehogs. Is that uh, in, in, uh, in Denmark or Europe wide? In Denmark. Denmark, yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, I'm I'm really happy about this because uh, uh, that that also protects the hedgehogs basically. Uh -huh. Um, absolutely. That, absolutely. That you have to live up to certain standard. Um, because it, it, it feels kind of counterintuitive to have all of that that law and legal protection in, in place and yet have these machines that, worst case scenario, I cannot imagine what the machine could do given the, the way you described some of the yeah. horrific 
test yeah. that you had yeah. that just seems completely against the the I want to say the spirit, but the intention of these legal protections. So that the two do seem to go completely against each other. So I can see why this is really Im important. So it's great to hear that that the the manufacturers are on board and keen to help. Yeah, but they they really are, uh, and I'm very happy about this. Um, and I hope to to reach out to all of them. I'm pretty certain that they've all read the scientific article by now. Um, but uh, <coughs> word is spreading. Uh, now, now, talking um, about the scientific article, you sent me a link which I've put in the video description here that people can download the, the actual research paper um, that came out of all of this research. And actually, it's, it is very thorough, but it gives all the details of the results of these, of these tests and kind of lists you, you had bracketed different models into different kind of damage groups. But yeah. it, it kind of gives all of that information. So if anyone's interested, by all means, use that link in, in the uh, video description and go ahead and, and read that for yourself. It's it's absolutely fascinating to to see. Well, it's it's fascinating to hear the behind the scenes, how you go about setting up these tests and working through and, and then getting the results and, and what you've what you've then documented this, what you can download um, is is absolutely brilliant. That's fantastic. And uh, I wanted to show you a figure from the scientific article because mm -hmm. I get a lot of questions. So I have this uh, specific model of robotic lawnmower in my garden. Uh, was that one of the, the lawnmowers that did well yeah. with the test or, or not? Yeah, I'm sure. So, so I'm going to show you a, a figure uh, that shows how uh, the different uh, 18 different models we tested performed. Okay. But obviously we haven't tested all the different uh, uh, models on the market. So this is only based on the 18 models we actually tested. Yeah. Can you see it now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, here we have all the different models represented. You can read the names of the models. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the damage categories are, are divided into colors. Right. So what we found was that the majority of machines could not detect the uh, dependent juveniles, the juveniles below 200 grams. So they would basically just run over them. Yeah. Um, but, well, you could say it was luck. Most of these juveniles were so small that they wouldn't uh, re even reach the knives of the machines. Okay. So, so in the case where you see the blue color, uh, uh, these hedgehogs, um, uh, uh, the, the small hedgehogs weren't injured. They they would just basically run over um, uh, without being injured. Yeah. So uh, can you see my uh, pointer here as well? Uh, just mm -hmm. looking for it on the screen. It's not moving, is it? Uh, I can't no. see it if I'm honest okay. with you. Uh, so, but uh, but on the y-axis, as yep. it is called, you can see the test positions. That was the. Uh, three positions I told you right. about. Yes. yes. And then the weight class is on the x axis. So, weight oh, class okay. one is uh, the very small juveniles, two are, are the um, uh, independent juveniles, three are the adults, and four are the large adults. Large. Okay. And uh, and then so if if you take away the blue color indicating the very small juveniles that were not harmed but run over, um, you, you would go for the lightest of colors. Mm -hmm. So so the models with the lightest of colors on this graph uh, performed best in terms of hedgehog safety. Okay. Um, so it's obvious that, that some of the models are almost black, which meant that uh, they mutilated the hedgehogs uh, or at least uh, hurt them uh, yeah. uh, in general. Uh, and there are also models uh, which if, if you take away the blue color, they uh, almost only have uh, like white and very light colors. Uh, and these were the, the most uh, hedgehog friendly machines. Okay, okay. And the this... question is, would, would, you, yep. would you actually call any of these machines completely safe to hedgehogs? Because yeah. as I mentioned earlier, they all had to interact physically with the hedgehogs. So, so to, to call them completely safe for hedgehogs is, is perhaps to overdo it. But, uh, but there are definitely, when you have a look at this uh, figure, 
um, models that performed better than others with regards to hedgehog safety. Absolutely, and that's, that is so just, just kind of stands out on the page almost as as you're looking at that the comparison between between models and that the the color differences. Yeah. But but like you said, Sophie, the the these are these are 18 models that you tested. It may be that that people are going to look at uh, either the automatic lawnmower that they have or look at buying an automatic lawnmower, which may not be one of those 18. So in those cases, education is, is so important. What are those things specifically that you mentioned that people should look out for? These are, these are the technical specifications that are more likely to indicate that a automatic lawnmower would, hedge, would be more hedgehog friendly. What are those things again, just for people to remember? Yeah, so so we only tested eighteen uh, different models, and and I can't guarantee that that even though you you follow these uh, instructions that the robotic lawnmower you buy uh, would would be completely hedgehog safe because if we haven't tested it, I wouldn't know. But I would definitely go for a model with pivoting blades, a model with front wheel drive. Uh, and a model with three wheels. Okay, okay. And the pivoting blades are the are important because they also go under that. They've got a skid pa uh, skid plate specifically and can be okay. Okay, yeah. so pivoting blades, three wheels, and front wheel drive. Yeah, and and we also saw that some of the machines with four wheels uh, did well if they had front wheel drive and pivoting blades. Okay. Okay, but, but, but hopefully, yeah. Sorry, carry on. But but until we've tested all the different models yeah. on the market, it's still very important to to advise uh, on the fact that you should only let your robotic lawnmower run during the daytime. Yes, uh, because the hedgehogs are nocturnal. You can see them out during the day for several different reasons, uh, not necessarily because they're close to death, but Still, it's uh, the the odds of meeting uh, a hedgehog during daytime compared to nighttime. Uh, you know, yeah. Uh, so, so it's it's uh, it's better to to just run the the robotic lawnmower during day, and and I've heard from uh, from people that uh, that that's obvious to do that. Of course, we would let it run during the day. Why would you do it at night? But the fact is that in uh, the Scandinavian countries, at least, I know that uh, a lot of people think that it's very convenient that the mm -hmm. robotic lawnmower is running during nighttime because mm -hmm. then they're not using their garden and it won't disturb or, or make any yeah. sorts of noises or anything. And um, and that's very convenient. Um, so so that's why I'm mentioning it. And yeah. uh, and it's also important to, to check the lawn uh, uh, for for different species that could be uh, vulnerable to to the robotic lawnmower before uh, you turn on the robotic lawnmower, uh, th this could obviously be hedgehogs, but also, for example, leverets uh, that would hide in the grass and stand completely still in the face of danger. It could also be amphibians or you know baby birds. Um, so it, it is really important just to, to check the lawn before the machine starts. And that's, of course, not very convenient because the whole idea of a robotic lawnmower is that you don't have to do anything. It will just, you know, it's, it get programmed and start on a different or uh, particular, you know, time schedule and you yeah. don't have to do anything. But um, but if you want to, to, to do your best to, to avoid hurting wildlife in your garden when using robotic lawnmowers, uh, these would be the different advices. Perfect. And hopefully soon, based on your research, we may also get that hedgehog friendly badge on these types of products, which would be absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I really do hope so. So you're, that, was, that was your most recent research, and that is exceptionally fascinating. And thank you so much for, for presenting it. But I, I, I say that very deliberately because you're not one to sit on your laurels. You're immediately off researching something else relating to hedgehogs. Yeah. So tell us what you're currently researching and, and the direction you're going with your new research. 
Yeah, so I've just uh, very recently published uh, a scientific article about um, stress levels in hedgehogs and the post-release survival of uh, rehabilitated hedgehogs, where I investigated um, how uh, wild juvenile hedgehogs compared to rehabilitated orphans, you know, hand-raised orphans would actually cope when they were translocated and released back into the wild. Uh, and I also tested the stress levels of wild compared to rehabilitated hedgehogs. And I could see that the stress hormone levels, that would be the corticosterones, uh, were significantly higher in the rehabilitated hedgehogs, indicating that hedgehogs are prone to stress uh, when they are in care. Even though we, we mean well and, and we want the best for the hedgehogs, they are wild animals and, uh, and, and they do uh, get stressed from being in captivity, even though we do our best. Yeah. Uh, and um, I also tested the personality of these hedgehogs, whether okay. they were more shy or bold, and, uh, and that didn't uh, affect uh, their ability to survive in the wild. Okay. Uh, I would have thought that the bolder ones would get themselves into all sorts of trouble. Yeah. Uh, but, but the survival was the same. Okay. Uh, so what we, what we learned from this article uh, was that it actually seems to pay to hand raise the orphaned hedgehogs because they're able to survive as well as the wild ones being raised naturally uh, by their mothers in the wild. And I was really, really happy to see this because a lot of effort is being put into to hand raising these uh, orphans. A lot of money and a lot of effort. Uh, it's every, you know, two, three hours around the clock when they're small and, and sometimes even more often uh, when, when they're newborn. So it's a lot of work for, for the carers. So I'm, I'm really happy to see that this conservation effort actually pays off. Absolutely, it's so it's so good to know that that type of thing is 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 paying off, as you say. That there's there's benefit from doing that and putting in all of that all of that effort. And I know just looking, Catherine, we mentioned earlier was from Germany, and I know she's she's been in the chat saying that she's she's part of a uh, I think a a hospital or a, a facility directly. And so yeah. Catherine's immediately responded by saying that's good to know this is this is such good information to have um and the benefit of this this research in terms of being able to feed it back into our hospitals and our our other kind of wildlife centers and just know that that these these hedgehogs can have stress can suffer stress no matter how how kind of caring we try to be yeah i do have a question though you mentioned Ooh the personality of a hedgehog how do you measure the personality of a hedgehog yeah i'm glad you're asking um so so what we did was uh, to to test uh, so they the wild juveniles and the rehabilitated juveniles um were placed in outdoor enclosures for a week where we tested their personality and took all these stress measures. Uh, we, we measured the, the hormone levels in their saliva and in their feces. And uh, so we, we did what is called um, a, a novel object test on the hedgehog uh, and, uh, and um, a novel arena test. And the novel arena test is basically to see uh, how they will react when they're placed in, for example, a new enclosure. So, so we put uh, the, the cat carrier with the hedgehog into the new enclosure and, and we watched the enclosure for 15 minutes and saw whether the hedgehog would actually dare to, to leave uh, the carrier box and explore the enclosure. And some of the individuals stayed in the carrier throughout the 15 minutes and, and other individuals would be out exploring straight away, uh, eating cat food in the middle of everything and uh, uh, having a lot of time to just sniff around and explore. It was really fun to, to see. And the, the novel object test, then we, we placed a, a, a very colorful uh, a football in the middle of this enclosure and then tested whether the hedgehog would actually get out of the hedgehog house and, and explore this football. 
and and uh, how how close to the football it it would get and and we had individuals that just stayed in in the house and wouldn't come out and and we had individuals that would actually push the football around <laughs> um and we also tested the, with the badger feces and a teddy bear mim mimicking a badger because I thought perhaps mm -hmm. this is a, an instinct that they know to avoid badgers. Uh, and, and we also recorded whether they would actually dare to, to get close to, to this box uh, smelling of badger feces and, and the badger teddy bear. And it was really, it was so fun to, to observe this because, uh, it was so much fun to see how some would just hide in the hedgehog house, not coming out, and <laughs> some would just explore, uh, yeah. not being afraid of anything. And and I'm sure everybody who who have uh, who have seen the hedgehogs in their garden or, or are caring for hedgehogs have noticed that yeah. some of them are just more bold than others. Um, absolutely, absolutely. That's that's been a. a a common comment and a common thread in, in all discussions and conversations that just hedgehogs have these unique personalities and no to, you know, it, it's it, when they're on the camera, they can, well, actually, no, it's when they're on the camera, you can see the personality, even just in the way that they strut around the garden or they sniff around or they, they come and actually interact with the camera. Every single one has, as like Catherine says in the chat, every single one has a different and unique personality. So yeah. being able to know how, from a scientific research perspective, you can actually do this testing is, is fantastic. And again, it's it's just so interesting for us that that have them in our gardens or see them on the camera that that these things can be tested from a scientific perspective and then be used for in bouldering or well, kind of enhancing our in our knowledge of of hedgehogs so it's brilliant it's absolutely fascinating and i i, I just thought of this experiment when i was hand raising uh, the juveniles uh, myself because yep. Uh, I could tell that some of them were more, more bold, and I was really worried when when we had to release them back into the wild. Uh, mm. my, my poor darlings, which I had cared for around the clock, would they be able to survive? And yeah. and and would they get themselves into trouble? Should we actually try and screen them for personality and and release the bolder ones in in more safe environments? So, or yeah. what should we do? Uh, so the sample size in my study wasn't very large. Okay. Uh, it was only, you know, 27 hedgehogs we tested for personality and so on. But it was interesting to see, and 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 the results were clear. The wild individuals and uh, and the rehabilitated uh, individuals uh, did equally well or poor. It, it was about 50% survival um, from release uh, during the early autumn to to their first hibernation, and uh, and personality did not influence uh, survival. So. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. That's that's just like I say, it's just so so good to know these these things and, and that you can test them. Uh Sophie, I've got some questions from uh people who have submitted questions. Uh we've got a form, as you know, and people have been submitting questions. Uh I actually only have, have a couple of questions, but the first one is from Karen, who has asked something that you may be able to help her with, with regards the health of a hedgehog. Um, and she says she's got a resident male that is about 1.2 kilograms, so quite a large male. Uh, and this one has white either side, um, uh, yes, has white either side. Could that be maybe a skin or white skin or, or fungus on its, on its neck? Uh, it's got some spines missing, uh, but they seem to be regrowing. Uh, and the vet has advised her that it isn't ringworm and it's not lice or mange. Have you any thoughts on perhaps what that white might be? So if, if there is loss of spines, I would definitely uh, get the hedgehog uh, checked over uh, with an experienced hedgehog carer uh, to do a skin scrape and, and test for ringworm because that would be my initial thought. Um, sometimes the hedgehogs also lose their spines due to um, vitamin or zinc deficiency and so on, but I would definitely advise her to, to, um, to get the hedgehog checked over by a, a hedgehog carer. Okay, okay. Uh, and then just another question uh, that came in from Heather, who asked something that actually we've been discussing 
uh, are there any makes of automatic lawnmower that are safe for hedgehogs? And she can, of course, download your uh, research paper with that beautiful graphic, as well as we now know that there are some specific things to look out for, which may make a, an automatic lawnmower safer than, than another model, but at least we've, we've got that information. So Heather, thank you so much for your question. Uh, I'm just going to refer you to the link, which is in the video description, uh, and you can get hold of that research and read, read through it, which is absolutely brilliant. Sophie, it has been an absolute joy and pleasure to have you. And thank you so much for joining. Um, it is not often that I get a PhD in hedgehogs joining. I've now had two in a row between yourself uh, and Lucy Behrman Brown the last time in, in May, which is absolutely brilliant. It's so fascinating to get an insight into the actual scientific research that's, that's happening. Uh, and it really does bring to bear the, the fact that having them just outside the back door in the garden is, is just such a privilege and, and a pleasure to, to have them and to be able to interact with them or have them interact with, with uh, our gardens and, and others in our gardens rather than us interacting with them. But Sophie, thank you so very much for joining me and uh, for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and thank you very much to everyone else who has has participated and joined. It's been wonderful to have you. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. And I'll uh, update uh, my Facebook page called Pinsweene Forsning Hedgehog Research in Denmark. I hope you'll uh, add the link to the description of the video. Absolutely. Where I post all the news about my, my research projects because there are many uh, and, uh, and I'm very happy to, to share everything I learned uh, from these projects. Absolutely. And we, of course, learned the word for hedgehog in Danish, which is pintsvin. Uh, yeah. And so now we know what a pintsvin is. Um, and yes, the, the link to Sophie's Facebook page is also in the video description, as well as Sophie, I never mentioned you have your own Dr. Hedgehog YouTube channel. So you're yeah. also venturing into, into YouTube. Um, yeah. So go along. The link to that is, is in the video description as well. Please go along and subscribe to, to uh, Sophie's channel. That, of course, promises to have lots of more information about her research. And if you're interested, that is absolutely brilliant to, to be involved in and see and, and uh, see what's coming. So Facebook page, link in the description, as well as the, the YouTube channel, which is brilliant, as well as you can download that research and, and just keep up to date with everything that Sophie is doing. It's been an absolute pleasure and joy and delight, Sophie. Thank you so much for joining me and, and spending time um, and showing us and walking us through your research. It's been absolutely wonderful. Uh, and, and all the best for your research ongoing. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks so much. Take care now. And to everyone else, thank you so much for joining me this evening. I hope you've had a wonderful time. Do, uh, of course, like or leave any comments in the in the video, below the video itself, uh, and subscribe to the channel if, if you're new. It's been wonderful having you along. From myself, Mike, you take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.